from the East Texas Sports Network Studios, powered by Texas Dairy Queen, a tradition of excellence, the ETSN Podcast, where Clint Buckley and Mike Graham offer their, offer their, well, they just talk. It's the lowdown on everything high school football in East Texas. And now, Clint Buckley and Mike Graham. And Mike Graham. Hello, hello, and welcome to the week two edition and season premiere of the ETSN.FM podcast. I'm Clint Buckley, and I'm joined by Mike Graham. We meant to come to you sooner with a show to preview the season last week, but uh, as, as life often does, it got in the way. Uh, but everything's good now, and we have a ton to talk about today. What's up, Mike? Not too much. Yeah, both of us had air conditioning problems this year, and, and that's what the holdup was. And this is a terrible time of the year to have air conditioning malfunctions. This is this is not the state and not the time of year for that to happen. So Absolutely not, but it is a great time for the football season. Yes, and we know that since the football season has started, cooler weather is eventually going to be on the way, and uh, we hope that sooner rather than later. But uh, before that, uh, we, we need to talk about week one last week. It was a crazy week. Uh, we had a lot of good matchups and a lot of surprising outcomes. Uh, I guess we're going to run through a little bit of the uh, impressions that we had in, in week one, and I guess we're going to start with... Uh, Gilmer, they they've got a quarterback. You know that was one of the uh, the uh, concerns coming into the season after the graduation of Zach Spears is who was going to take over. And uh, well, we got the answer, and we got the answer uh, pretty emphatically uh, last Thursday night in their season opener against Liberty Ilo. Junior Aaron Poppy Brown uh, not only had a sparkling debut, uh, he set a school record, and he beat a, a school record uh, held by G.J. Kinney, who went on to uh, star in college at Tulsa, and then uh, eventually. Uh, played a little bit in the NFL, 577 yards in his varsity debut. Yeah, that's insane. And, um, you know, if you want to tap the brakes on talking about a legend and all that stuff, but that's like a, a legendary way to uh, to begin a high school career. And he's only a junior, so there's a, there's a lot more to go with him. Yeah, no doubt about it. Gilmer, if, if he continues to, on that climb, and, and you have to assume he's only going to get better, um, Gilmer's going to be another fun team to watch again this year. Uh, looking forward to seeing what Gilmer does the rest of the season. Also, uh, what stood out to us and uh, stood out to me anyway was uh, Tyler Lee. Uh, talk about debuts. Head coach Clayton George, his first game as, as Robert E. Lee's head coach. He comes in. They play a really good Marshall team from last year, returning a lot of good players. And, wow, Lee kind of had their way with Marshall. And, and not only did they did they dominate, they dominated defensively, which is something we haven't said very often about Lee's defense over the past several seasons. Uh, last year they allowed 49 points per game. They hold Marshall to less than 100 yards and only seven points. Could have shut him out. That's a that's a great way to start the uh, Clayton George era for, for Robert E. Lee. Right, 83 yards. And going into that game, I would have pegged Tyler Lee as the underdog. You know, you've got a lot of great athletes returning from Marshall's three-round deep 5A playoff team. Tyler Lee, a lot of the times, was non-competitive in its 6A games, largely because of that defense. Um, we knew that they'd have two good players coming into this season. Uh, actually, three, but... You just you didn't see it all coming together the way it did in Week One, and and what a statement win and a really good offensive performance for the Red Raiders too. And I think yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of a not what we expected from Lee. I think we both kind of ex, you know expected it could be it could be a shootout, you know, because uh, Clayton George's background is in offense. He was the offensive coordinator for several years at South Lake Carroll, um, and he had a lot of lot of lot of you know work with some some pretty renowned quarterbacks. And Chance Amy is a really good quarterback, but um, I guess the game plan didn't call for that because they didn't throw the ball all, all that much. I think they only attempted eight passes on the night. Instead, they turned to their ground game, and I tell you what, they've got a good sophomore running back uh, named Ladarius Wickware, who's uh, going to be going to be a force around this region for the next couple of years. He goes for 200 yards in his debut. So uh, I guess the theme so far of Week One has been, you know sizzling debuts for for not only players but coaches as well so uh, congratulations to coach Clayton George on the big win Um, and then moving on to someone who we both kind of had an idea was going to be a pretty good player this year he's been a pretty good player for the last couple of years Tristan Ebner Uh, the TCU commit the Henderson standout uh, he, he plays both sides of the ball and I guess he's he's involved in all three aspects uh, of the game offense defense special teams Scored five touchdowns in Henderson's season-opening win over Atlanta, a very impressive win, 44-13, to over, over a pretty good Atlanta club. And uh, Ebner scores five touchdowns. He catches three touchdown passes. 
He has a pick six on defense, and he returns a punt for a touchdown. Yeah. So uh, what, what else can you say about Tristan Ebner? Well, I, I think that that whole Henderson team is awfully mad about how last season and I mean, they had a 7-3 and three overall record and, and missed the playoffs because they lost the wrong games in their district. And um, beating Atlanta like that, that, that's a great sign for what this team is capable of because Atlanta is a very good team, yep. especially on defense, and, and they just got rolled in this game. Um, one team that kind of jumped off the page to us last week and, and probably under the, under the category of most impressive, perhaps, over the first week, and the, uh, the Malakoff Tigers. I mean, we, we kind of expected them to have a pretty good season last year. They came so close to knocking off Cameron Yo um, in the playoffs last year. Uh, they return a lot of players. Uh, their program is, has been on the rise for the last several years under the head coach, Jamie Driscoll. And wow, they just they just laid it on Bullard, a four A Bullard team who we expect to, to be a playoff contender in, in the uh, so called District of Doom, forty six to seven for Malakoff. Exactly, I mean Bullard is a full division above them. You know, yeah. d- there's Division One and there's Division Two. Bullard's four A Division One, Malakoff's three A Division One. Two classifications removed. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it was a huge win and. The biggest takeaway for me is that Malakoff got up big on Cameron Yo, which was en route to its fifth consecutive state championship game appearance. Right. And they they held a huge lead on, on Cameron Yo and blew it. They come back this year, get a huge lead against a much bigger opponent that's deep and can rotate against them and maintain that lead the whole game. It was forty to zero and the, the final margin was forty six to zero. Yeah, that's seven. a that's a good sign moving forward for Malakoff because now they know you know, they get up on folks, and then they they go for that killer instinct. They go for the jugular. They you know they step on the throat, so to speak, and and don't let don't let them uh, get back into the game. Very impressive for Malakoff. It'll be interesting to see how how they do not only this regular season, but uh, I have a pretty good had a pretty good chance. I have a pretty good feeling they're gonna they're gonna make some noise once the playoffs begin here in a couple of months. Uh, Tatum uh, on their way back, uh, perhaps. I you know they were zero and ten last year. Uh, they have a new coach, Craig Barker, who has some experience in this area. He was uh, previously at Kaufman, but he, of course he had been the head coach at Garrison, and he was an assistant on the uh, state championship team at Henderson. His first game at Tatum, they go up against a a team that we feel like is going to be a contender for 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 big things, uh, maybe even state in, in the, at the 3A level in ARP, and uh, they come away with a 24-14 win, so not a bad debut for Craig Barker. Uh, first game, first win after an 0-10 season last year. That's a nice win and a tough win because – you know those two teams couldn't get very far away from each other the, the way they run their offenses, and uh, and uh, Tatum just kind of held that margin of, of victory wire to wire. Yeah, very impressive for Tatum. So we expect big things from the Eagles this year. Um, and then one last uh, one last headliner from 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 uh, Week One, the Van Vandals. You know uh, we talked about um, their matchup. Uh, you know off air about uh, the Mineola last week, and we we thought it could it had the potential to be a great game. Wasn't that great a game? Uh, Van kind of took it to Mineola and ended their long uh, regular season winning streak. You were there in attendance. What uh, stood out to you for Van? Right, there were some swinging points in that game. Um, and Garrett Mosley, the quarterback, seemed to convert them all. It played a lot like Blake Bell. They did a lot of uh, uh, run pass options with him, and he just ended up taking it down the hole every time and uh, ran for 141 yards on. Uh, 29 carries, 27 from the quarterback spot, and they experimented with uh, Jackson Taylor at quarterback and and Mosley at running back. So he he's multiple threat. Uh, I thought that their defensive backfield did very well. Cooper Bledsoe in particular, two interceptions in that game. Uh, Connor Houston catches for 100 yards. So it looks like they've got a pretty well rounded team uh, around a new offensive line with with four new guys that that performed well against Mineola. So we'll see how that carries over into the into the next weeks. Now that they're moving back up into Class 4A competition. All right, well, that's uh, what kind of caught our attention in week one. Now let's moving on to uh, week two. Uh, we've got a lot of rivalry games this week, and I guess we'll start with um, Lufkin and Nacogdoches. It's our uh, ETSN and Dairy Queen game of the week. I'll be down there in Nacogdoches on Friday night. Uh, both of these teams looked really good in week one. Uh, Lufkin was able to uh, avenge you know, the, the, the playoff loss last year to Longview by winning 35-24, and then Nacogdoches had an outstanding performance against uh, Kilgore. In, in their season opener, winning that one 48-21. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. I think it's going to be a really fun game. Um, obviously, it's a rivalry game, mm-hmm. and, and these two communities love football, so you can be sure that Dragon Stadium is going to be at capacity. And they love to dislike one another. Yes. I was impressed with uh, Lufkin's win. I thought that they'd win by more because Longview was young, but that Longview team 
it's young and it had some bite and, and they got through that game. And then you've got Nacogdoches who just blew the doors off Kilgore in the second quarter and flashed a lot of athleticism and a really well-rounded offense and a, a good defense to support them because once they built that margin, the margin did not change very much for the rest of the game. Yeah, and I think the key matchup in this one is, is going to be Lufkin's offense and Nacogdoches' defense. And in particular, the receiving core for Lufkin against a pretty pretty good Nacogdoches secondary. Uh, Josh Thompson, of course, is the uh, – Texas commit. He played mostly cornerback a season ago, but they've uh, moved him to to uh, safety this year. He made a lot of big plays last week. I think he made three tackles for loss. Uh, he was able to to um, to return a punt for a touchdown in the game as well. Um, and then you mentioned uh, you mentioned how how when you talk about Nacogdoches as secondary, you also you also got to look at the other pieces too. And they've got an, they've got another good player back there in Deryan Williams. Who we saw at the uh, ETSN Combine? Yes, we really liked him. Uh, he was he was phenomenal. He tested really well. Um, they kind of he's kind of used as kind of a hybrid linebacker and, and defensive back, but uh, you know he, he's going to be asked to do a lot of a lot of things in coverage. And then you look at Lufkin's receiving core. Uh, they've got Dalen Phillips, who I think is one of the best, most physically gifted receivers in the area as far as size goes, and obviously has a ton of athleticism. He's he's holds a few uh, Division One offers already, and then uh, a couple of talented sophomores. Two in Javante Ellington and Malik Jackson um, at receiver, and then you know one of the best dual threat quarterbacks around in Cordell Rogers. So I think this is going to be a big key. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, Nacogdoches boasts that its front is so much better than than last year, and it needs to be um, to keep up with these guys. Because I mean, you, you think about all the places that Rogers can fling the ball, and if that doesn't work. He can take off and run. So there, there are a lot of problems that Nacogdoches is going to have to address, of course, with Josh Thompson in the backfield, mm-hmm. um, probably ensuring that they're going to have to play at least one more play. It's going to be tough to get behind him. Um, another big rivalry uh, game this week is uh, maybe the best rivalry in all of East Texas. It's Longview against Marshall. It's definitely the oldest. Uh, these two teams have uh, met over 100 times in their, in their uh, long history. And uh, I think it's an important game. I know it's still early in the season, but I think it's important for both of these two teams because – uh, you look at you, you look at zero and two to start the se- season, and it's that's not ideal. Yes, and, and like I said, I mean Longview was a team that brought back four starters from its four round five A team last year, going into six A. Yep. Faces Lufkin, which is a really complete team in, in week one. So I, I'm 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 happy with where they are right now. I, th- I think that they've got the edge in this game. Marshall, uh, Marshall is, you know, it, I guess the jury is still out on that. Right. I mean, that game could the league game could have been an aberration for true. them, or I mean, that could be who they are at this point in the season. Of course, they're they're replacing a four year starting quarterback in, in Justin Hart, and in their growing pains that quarterbacks have to go through. Fortunately, this is largely an exhibition game. I mean, yeah. don't, don't tell that to the guys right. <laughs> in this rivalry. But Once the game but, kicks off, they won't, it won't feel like an exhibition game. Yeah, these games don't count towards the playoff. Uh, you're working on things, and, and uh, hopefully they can turn a corner as well. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, look at, uh, you look at Marshall's offense last week. Um, they weren't able to run the ball, which I found a little bit surprising considering that Cameron Haller – you know they're they're really big tough running back. Uh, he rushed for over eighteen hundred yards a season ago. Was back uh, running behind a pretty pretty decent offensive line uh, anchored by Chase and Hines and of course Cameron King. A couple of really good looking junior players on that offensive line weren't able to get anything going on the ground against Lee. And then the passing game struggled as a result. Uh, Marshall is going to have to figure some things out on offense moving forward. So we'll we'll, we'll keep an eye on this game. Uh, of course. Uh, Another game to watch this week, Gilmer against Center. This is a rematch of a third-round playoff game that uh, I believe you saw last year. Yes. And uh, you'll be covering this game Friday at, at, uh, in Gilmer. Talk about uh, what you expect from these two teams. Right. It was just two games ago for Center and, and four for, for Gilmer. Um, so they're not very far removed from each other. I think that, obviously, Gilmer holds a psychological advantage of, of winning, and they, they brought back a lot. Center brought back 11 players, too, so that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and they brought back their most valuable players. You know, you look at Gilmer last week playing Liberty Ilo, playing a team kind of reforming because its most valuable skill players were gone, and you just don't replace guys like Kamon Freeman and, and Andre Wiley from Liberty Ilo. Um, Center Thurman doesn't, Morbley right, as well. Exactly. Center does not have those problems. They've got quarterback Kyle Parks, who I, I think is going to end up with a couple of scholarship offers, a really good dual threat quarterback, and then receiver Octavius Evans, who who is a, a pretty big Big 12 uh, recruit with offers from Oklahoma State and Texas Tech to, right. to run that offense. And when you've got Evans, 
you you open up so much else, so much so much for everyone else because you're gonna have to slant coverages against him. You're gonna have to overload uh, at times. That's gonna allow uh, Parks to run around and and uh, get some other receivers right, and involved. get some other receivers involved. And I think that's going to be tough for Gilmer. I uh, don't think they'll be able to pull away in this one. Um, but then you look at. Poppy Brown and yeah. Lamarcus Morton had a huge game. We we forgot to talk about him, but yeah. I mean, it's more than 250 yards is an Oklahoma State commitment. Ten from catches, Brown. three touchdowns. I mean, yeah, I mean he. Uh, you could tell he was excited that the season was 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 here. Uh, he had a great uh, week one performance, and I think this is exciting. You got two of the best receivers in the state. I feel like and. Uh, easily two of the best in the in the region, and and the Lamarcus Morton and Octavius Evans. They they might both become Oklahoma State commitments that's because true. they both have offers. Uh, that, that's and true. they're they're probably going to work against each other because Morton plays some cornerback for Gilmer. That is true. So yeah, we could see we could see them lining up one on one. Um, and then one last game I think is pretty intriguing is Carthage against Liberty Ilo, and and uh, you know these are two big names. Uh, Carthage, of course, is a uh, one of the best programs around. Uh, they've won four state championships under head coach Scott Surratt in the last uh, you know decade or so. And then you've got Liberty Ilo program that was uh, this, this kind of resurrected the last couple of seasons. Uh, this one's interesting because Carthage was only able to play about a quarter and a half last week because uh, their season opener against Gladewater, the power went out. And uh, they decided to cancel the game instead of having to come back uh, Saturday. And I don't think that there were any guarantees that the, the, the power situation would have been fixed by then. So they just decided to uh, call it a day, call it a week. So Carthage not an official game yet on, on, the, uh, on the season. And do you think that affects them uh, more than, say, Liberty Ilo coming into this week? Well, it definitely would have been nice to get two and a half more quarters of experience. But I, I think the, the only thing that they're going to remember from that game is how infuriating – it was that the game was not respected enough that they couldn't get the power running at yes. some point to to run that. I don't think it's going to hurt them. They they have a they have a good team and should have some confidence because they were they were beating Gladewater at the time and, right. and Gladewater is a great physical team just like Liberty Ilo uh, and and Gladewater might even be more put together at this point in the season. Yeah, and uh, Liberty Ilo, you know they they lose to Gilmer, but I mean. Shoot, they score fifty-five points, right. uh, and that's you know having to retool their entire offense with all those uh, all those uh, pieces you know lost to graduation. Uh, but I tell you what, their running game looked really good against Gilmer. They had a couple of guys that each went over hundred yards. Uh, Cameron Levingston, who uh, was in the running back rotation a season ago, and another guy named Kevin Florence, uh, who you know was was just as good uh, out of the backfield. So. Um, that that is an intriguing matchup to me, uh, just because I want to see what Carthage looks like after a whole game. You know, we haven't had that chance yet, and uh, so that'll be interesting to watch for this week. So, uh, one, uh, really quick before we get out of here, uh, we already kind of mentioned one of these guys, our players of the week, uh, offensive player of the week, is of course the Gilmer Junior quarterback Poppy Brown. We mentioned at the top, 577 yards, a school record. He passed for six touchdowns, ran for another. Uh, and Gilmer was able to outlast Liberty Ilo 61-55. So congratulations to Poppy on his Player of the Week honor. And then the Defensive Player of the Week was Keelan Johnson from Wascom. And it, it's funny to talk about Wascom because r- retroactively, when you think about last season, they, they won the last two Player of the, Weeks, Player of the Week awards. So yep. uh, they're 3-for-3 they're three three recently. And he had a big game uh, on both sides of the ball for, for Wascom in, in getting them to their 32nd consecutive win. He... Uh, Made 15 tackles, two for loss on defense. He also recovered an offensive fumble in the end zone of second overtime, which gave Wascom the go-ahead touchdown. Uh, they punched the ball in uh, for a two-point conversion, and then they they give up the, the the potentially tying touchdown to Jefferson, but they hang on on the on the Jefferson two-point conversion attempt and win the game. They've got an interesting game coming up against Harmony. I think Keelan Johnson is going to be a big key uh, against Harmony. All right, so once again, congratulations to our Offensive and Defensive Players of the Week. Well, that's going to do it. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, We hope you enjoyed our first podcast of the season. We've got tons of content up on the site right now. It's all up for your perusal at etsn.fm. Be sure to check all of that out. Of course, if you have any questions or comments for either of us, you can hit us up on Twitter. I'm at Clint Buckley. Mike is at Mike underscore ETSN. Or you can hit us up on the main account at ETSN FM. And don't forget to download the ETSN.FM app on your iPhone or Android device. It is available now at the App Store. All right, everybody, have a great Labor Day weekend, and we will talk to you all again next week.